Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. I have to tell you, I am just thrilled to actually be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, let me, I'll introduce myself a little bit. My name is Heidi Ruckel. Um, for goodness, over 20 years, uh, my husband and I lived here for 24 years in the Louisville area. I taught at Louisville Adventist Academy, as did my husband. Um, for many years, I see lots of faces of our students in this um, sanctuary. And we just recently transitioned to living outside of Nashville. It's comical though, most people say to us, how is it since you've moved to Tennessee? And I have to laugh because for the full time that we lived here, we only lived in Louisville one year. The very first year we lived here in 1999 to 2000, we lived in Louisville. And then we bought a house in Southern Indiana. And we lived in Southern Indiana the entirety of the time that we lived here. So then we moved to the Nashville area and we moved to Franklin, Kentucky. So in essence, we, re we finally moved to Kentucky. So um, uh, Chris Jewell told us recently, he laughed. He said, you guys just can't live in the state you work in, can you? And um, that <laughs> looks like it is indeed true. Um, so we uh, moved. Brent is teaching at Highland Elementary. He is the seventh and eighth grade teacher there, their middle school teacher. And I am at the conference office um, in the education department. I spend lots and lots of time with lots and lots of different children. I think I have been in every school this school year, um, except for Louisville and Lexington. I think Brent and I figured it out that we kind of looked at those are the only two schools that I haven't been in this school year. Um, so it is a fun job, lots of lots of little faces, and I'm enjoying it. So um, I have to tell you the reason I said that I am extremely happy to be here. This particular Sabbath, a year ago, I was scheduled to preach here, and I got COVID, <laughs> and I could not come and preach. And then I was scheduled to preach here in, I think, February or March, and you all had a leak in your set, in one of your, hey, do you guys remember that? And so we actually, I did come and preach, but I think there was maybe 12 people in the sanctuary. It was mostly online. So I am happy to be here with a full sanctuary this morning. So pray with me before we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come close. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to enter your presence, to enter into your sanctuary together, together. Lord, I pray that you will calm my spirit, that you will fill me, that you will open hearts and minds, that you will speak through me, that you will... Press into me as I press into you. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Back in the summer of 1997, Brent and I had been married just three weeks. And um, we began a kind of crazy adventure. We went to the Marshall Islands to be student missionaries. And I have to tell you, um, it was a, a tough experience for the people that loved us the people that we left behind, particularly my mama. <clears throat> I was just 22 years old and newly married, and it was tough for her to watch her baby girl, the youngest of four, get on a plane and fly away for a year. I have to tell you, it was tough for me too, I must admit. I cried all the way from Nashville Airport to Houston. I pulled it together to run through the airport to catch our flight. Then I cried halfway from Houston <laughs> to Hawaii. Somewhere over the Pacific, I finally pulled it together. That year went by fast. We lived through a typhoon. We lived through a drought. We lived through... Um, trying to battle lice, making sure I didn't get it because all of my students have it. I cut my hair that was down to here up to above my shoulders. We lived through amazing birthday parties, um, beautiful people. It was a, I had scarlet fever somewhere in the mix of all that. Um, and we came home changed forever. Incidentally, I will say, I truly believe that that year um, kind of formed the way that Brent and I do ministry, how we're all in. Um, it was life changing. And that is kind of the way, to this day, the way we function in ministry. Um, 
that year. But I remember the following May, when we were finally headed home, there was this bubbly, giddy excitement that we were gonna get to see the people that we loved, that we had been away from while we were on the other side of the world. And I remember right after we got home a few days, um, I was at home in my parents' house and I had piled up in my mom and dad's bed Sunday morning and I had kind of talking to my mom as she kind of got ready for the day. And I was just kind of looking around the room, just taking it all in, breathing in the sights and sounds of home. When I noticed this little thing, this little airplane up on the shelf, and it had its nose up like it was taking off, and that was new. Um, if, here's the thing with my mama. The house that I'm currently living in is the 28th home I've lived in in my life. My dad was a pastor and we moved a lot. So from house to house to house, everything was different within the house, but our stuff was the same. Does that make sense? Because my mom wanted us to know that no matter where we were, home was home. And so I'm kind of taking in my, just the sights and the smells of my mama's bedroom. And I see this little plane and that was different. So I said, mama, what's with the plane? She said, oh, Dustin, my nephew. He left that here last one time, right after you all left, and I found it. She said, and I thought, ooh, I thought about my baby flying away on that plane. She said, so I set it up there on the shelf with the nose taking off. And every night I looked at that plane, and I thought about you, and I thought, I'm not going to put it down until she gets home. And I would pray every time I looked at that plane for your safety and for your safe return, that eventually another big plane would take off and that one would be bringing you home. And then she got up out of the bed and she said, but you're here with me now. And she touched the tip of that plane and put it in landing position. I have never gotten that plane out of my mind because you see that plane meant that my mama loved me. My mama had been praying for me. My mama had been hoping that I was home in her presence. Now I can tell you right here and now that back then I had no clue the amount of pain that I had put my mama through and worry. You see, now I have two daughters that are away at college. Soon will be three, and it's not easy. I have the blessing of FaceTime. I get to see my beautiful baby's faces multiple times a week, but it's not the same as sitting in a room with them. My, um, one of my daughters is home already from college for Christmas, and there's just something about just sitting in the presence of a person, right? Having them right there with you. There's just something about being together. This is the time of year that there are all these stories of families that have been apart coming together. We see all the time there's pictures of um, soldiers who've surprised their families, right, coming home. Does anybody remember that old Folgers commercial, Peter Comes Home? Anybody remember that commercial? No? I looked it up on. So in this commercial, it's a Folgers commercial, and you see, like, you know, the soft music's playing, and you see this perfect picturesque house and a car pull up. And somebody gets out and goes in to the house, and he puts down his presents, and then a little girl comes bounding down the steps, Peter, and what's comical is then they go in first thing, and instead of hugging, you know, he hugs her, and then he says, let's go make the coffee. <laughs> and so they go in, and they make coffee, and then that's what wakes his mama up. She smells the coffee. I want to tell you that is what would happen in our house if one of my children came home. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And she smells the coffee, and then they all come down, and they, Peter, and the last scene is them, you know, around opening their presents, and the mama's sips her coffee is comical. But the sentiment is that Peter had come home, right? They were together. 
Think about the songs that we sing at this time of year. I'll be home for Christmas. There's no place like home for the holidays. Celebrate me home. And the lists go on and on and on. We would seem, it seems, that we spend a large portion of this time of year thinking about being together, right? As humans, we take our with usness very seriously. But what is even more amazing to me is that God takes his with usness even more seriously than we do. It is at Christmas time that we tend to think about the gift that was given at Bethlehem. His with usness, if you will. We know that this is not the time of year that Jesus was born. However, I cannot think of a better thing for us to celebrate than the gift of Jesus. But here's the thing. While we spend the whole month of December celebrating God with us, like that story, the Bible is really just one giant love letter to us of him telling us how he wants to be close, how he wants to be in relationship with us, how he wants to be with us. This morning, we're gonna spend just a few minutes looking at Emmanuel, God with us. Open your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of John. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. If you have um, your Bible on an app and you want to read in the, same, um, in the same translation as me. John, now I will tell you the story of the way Christ came into the world is in beautiful detail is told in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. Mark skips it all together, gets right down to business of Jesus doing ministry, while John goes way back, way back to the very beginning. So let's look at verse one. In the beginning was the word. The word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word, was, the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. In the beginning was the word. Today when we read this, it seems like beautiful metaphoric poetry and we're like, oh, John was so poetic. No, no. So I wanna be clear about this. You have to understand what was going on at the time that this was written. For both the Greeks and the Hebrews, the term, the word, was at the very center of what they believed, okay? So John here is being very clear. So for the Greeks, the term the word was significant because they believed it to be the principle of reason that governed everything. So that was kind of what they would say, the word. It means it's this, we can reason together. We can understand everything because of the word, right? But for Hebrews, the word meant like what held everything together, creation, the principle, the agent of creation that had brought everything into existence. Think back to the beginning of the Bible. How does it start? Um, it was creation. The God was hovering over the face of the deep and he spoke the word, let there be light, and it was good. So in essence, right off the bat, John is saying here, you are both right. You're right. The word always existed. The word created everything. The word brings light, and the light shines through the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. The word gives us a way to reason things out. 
But then he goes a step further. Let's read 16, 6 through 14. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who was the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming in, into the world. He came into the world, the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, even they rejected him. But to all who believe in him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So John gets right to the point here. He's saying to the Greeks and the Hebrews, you are all correct. You're right. The word does do all of these things. It helps us to reason. It created everything. It does all these things. But let me tell you, the word was a man. The word was Jesus. And the word came here and wrapped himself up in human skin and lived right here among us. John is getting to the point here. If you notice, he, he tells you all you have to do is accept him. Like truly, if John had not written the whole rest of the book of John, he's got it all in this first 10 verses. He tells the entire thing right here. This is who he is. He is the word. You're all correct. It is fascinating to me that the God that created the entire world wrapped himself up in human skin and came down here to live with us. The God of glory, so bright that no one could even look at him without dying became a fetus and buried himself in a human womb. He became the tiny, minute, minutest thing that we can think of, right? Like, we think about him, I think, as a baby coming out. But we don't think about the fact that he was sitting in there when nobody could see him. Like, the same process that happens for all of us happened for him. Like he was this. The God of the universe made himself this and put himself in there. It's amazing, right? Amazing what he was willing to do to be with us. Because not only did he do that, but then he grew in that womb and he entered the world the same way that all of us have since Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve were created as adults. And since then, every single human that has ever walked this planet has come out the same way and it ain't pretty. And he did that. Jesus, in essence, was the first wrapped up Christmas gift. He was all wrapped up in human skin. And he did that all to be willing because he wanted to be with us. So why did Jesus have to come? Now, I'm going to tell you, typically... This is how I typically preach a sermon. Y'all are going to have to hold on because typically what I do is I find one text and then I expound on it. But here's the thing. With Jesus coming here to us, it's an overarching story that goes through the whole process, right? So we're going to look at the whole thing together. So buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be quick. We're going we're to jump on through it. We're going all the way back to Genesis. Why did Jesus have to come? We're in Genesis 3. And we're going to start at verse 6. 
Genesis 3. That's why I have all these lovely post-it notes, so I'm going to start taking them off so I'm less confused (laughs) as I go through them. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it gave her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So the figs leaves, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? As humans, I find it interesting. We all tend to focus so much on verse 6. Right? We focus on what she did. We focus on the fall. And admittedly, it's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal, the fall of humanity. I get it. But why on earth do we not focus more? Please don't miss the fact that it takes two verses. Two verses. Before we see something happening. God came after them. They fall, right? Verse 6, sin enters the world. Two verses. And he's coming after them. Where are you? He is looking for them already. He's wanting to be with them. We don't even make it to verse 10 before he's coming after them. Why do we miss it? We know what happens next. They are sent from their beautiful home. Sin has taken hold. There is no longer that face-to-face connection with God. We continue to see God making a way for physical closeness with us. Over and over, we see it through the Old Testament. Noah being saved from the flood. Abraham and his covenant. Jacob and his descendants. We literally see Jacob wrestling God. Joseph having a way to save his whole family. Moses at the burning bush. And then, and then something happens. Turn over to Exodus 13. Exodus 13, and we're going to begin at verse 20. I'll give you a second to get there. Exodus 13, verse 20. The Israelites left Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and then he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. They always, this always allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. Now it's fascinating here, if you don't really look look at it, um, if you don't put it into context, God is very um, methodical, right? So it had been 400 years that the Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt. And it had been 400 years of pretty much silence. Not that God wasn't moving, not that the Holy Spirit wasn't speaking to people, not that, not that things weren't happening, he wasn't moving. Clearly, he led Jochebed to put Moses into a, a, a boat, a basket. So he was speaking, he was moving, but he wasn't having that face-to-face connection. In essence, there had been pretty much silence for 400 years, right? So interestingly enough, Right before Jesus comes, at the end of Malachi, you see the the, uh, um, 
you see the prophecy of John the Baptist, and then there's silence. And from that time until Jesus comes, John the Baptist comes, it's 400 years. It's very interesting, sorry. I, I get, I'm a kind of nerd and geek out on this stuff. Anyway, all right, so, but with that, Jesus is saying here, okay, so at, we have the pillar of cloud during the day for them to see the pillar of fire. It's like God is looking at them and saying, I got you. I'm here. Because they had been so far removed from him. 400 years is a long time, folks. To put it into context, our country is not yet 400 years old. 400 years puts us right around the Mayflower. It's a long time. And it's a long time to sit in silence. So he knew, look, I've got to build my relationship back up with these people. I need them to know I'm here. I got your back. Daytime, nighttime, anytime, I'm here. You can't get rid of me. You can't shake me. Here I am, big as life, twice as natural. I'm here. He wanted them to know he wanted to be with them. God with us. There had been no FaceTime for that 400 years. And so there they are. Tabernacles would be built, which means literally tent with us. So it's interesting when God told them to build the tabernacle, he said, look, I want to camp with you. We're going to be here together in this wilderness for a while. So why don't you build me a place where I can reside with you? Tabernacles would be built the Ark of Covenant, the covenant would be made. Kings would come, queens would come. And still God would continue to show up all the while God was giving prophecies that would point to the Messiah. You see, Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see his life fulfill the way he was born, the way he died, the way he came, fulfill over 300 prophecies. We're going to look at just one of them today. Turn with me to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 13 and 14. I'll wait to stop hearing pages go. <clears throat> then Isaiah said, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look. The virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and will call him name, his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So he's saying, look, you people, you can't get it. You don't get it. Let me be blunt. This is how it's going to happen. A virgin's going to conceive, and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So let's look at where he fulfills that. Turn over to the book of Matthew. Look, we have made it to the, Old, to the New Testament, folks. We're not going back. We've flipped the page and gone over 400 years right there. The book of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All the 
of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. It will never cease to amaze me the process of Jesus coming to this earth. But what is even more amazing to me is the purpose. He was born with the sole purpose of dying. Verse 21 says he will save his people from their sins. He came to this earth as a baby so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Luke 2. We are going to skip the reading about Jesus' birth because we know the story. But I will say, I often think about how we sanitize that night with beautiful nativities. There's one right here behind me. We sanitize that, and don't get me wrong, I love nativities. I have one sitting on my piano right now. However, what Mary and Joseph and Jesus did that night was messy. Both literally, figuratively, and spiritually all wrapped up into one. You see, no birth is clean, even in a hospital let alone in a stable full of hay. I have always said that this is the part that makes me feel the worst for Mary because hay is the worst. Hay is so itchy, right? It's disgusting. Hay rides, you ever been on a hay ride? You get off a hay ride and you can't stop itching, right? Can you imagine giving birth in that stuff? I feel bad for her. Thinking about it. It's a tough way for these two who have not yet been together to bond. That's a tough way to to figure all that stuff out. But spiritually, God was telling Satan, the gauntlet has been thrown down. If you really think about it, that quiet manger, quiet. Anybody ever seen a quiet birth? I'm going to tell you, I do not believe that Mary gripped her teeth and bare it. I do not believe it. I think she screamed her head off. I do not think it was a silent night. Get a grip, folks. No silent night in that manger. It was a war room. God said, I'm coming for you. I am here. I am coming for you. Get ready, because I'm about to say, checkmate. The gauntlet had been thrown, and Satan would try from the very beginning to do away with that infant savior. He would go after him. You see, there weren't very many babies from around Bethlehem, Jesus' age, were there? They killed them all. They went after them. So Jesus was an outlier because he lived. Because Satan couldn't get him. It was a war room, folks. Don't sanitize it. But look at what happens in verse 8. That night there were shepherds staying in a field nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly 
an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, has been born today in the city of Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in the manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others in the armies of heaven, praising God and singing glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I love that it's referred to as an har- army, right? So it's like God is saying, look. I'm here, I'm ready to do battle, and I got a whole army behind me. And we're telling it, we're gonna tell what's happened. But look, do you see it? Have you really thought about that whole event? Here are these uneducated shepherds, which by the way, shepherds were the lowest of the low. All right, they were uneducated. And they were thought to be like second class citizens. It would be like, um, It would be like, well, like homeless people. Now, it would be like saying the king is coming and we're not gonna tell, we're not gonna tell the person that's up on Park Avenue about the king coming. We're gonna go out here to Bardstown Road where the people are sleeping in the cold and we're gonna tell them. That's who we're gonna tell about it. So that in and of itself is amazing. It's like, it's like God was saying, look, I'm here for everybody. I'm here for the people way up here. I love them too, but I'm here for the people that are way down here too. I love them all. I'm here for them all. I think sometimes we think about this in like terms, you think about Hollywood. I think it's very difficult for us as humans to be amazed anymore. I think we think, oh, it's just a trick. It's CGI. My kids, it's hilarious to watch a movie with my kids, especially old movies like from the 90s. They'll be like, look at that terrible CGI. Oh, so bad. Because everything looks so real to us right now. And so it's, it's, but they know it's not real. And we forget, we forget that this really happened. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being sitting out there, you're just having a conversation with your buddies and suddenly there's an angel up there and then there's a whole bunch more of them? Can you even imagine? But don't miss what he says. The KJV says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Do you see it? Here in this one sentence, These angels are speaking of his birth. Here he is. He has been born. And then all of a sudden they speak about his death. Like right there. He's going to be born and then he's going to die. All wrapped up into one sentence. You see the shadow that is cast from the manger is the cross. Don't miss it. There was one purpose One purpose only. He came to die. As Christ grew to be a man and he worked in his ministry here on earth, he had one goal, salvation. And not just for the time, but for all of eternity. So turn back over to the book of John where we started. John 14. In the 14th chapter of the book of John. And we're going to begin at verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There are more than enough rooms in my father's home. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am, and you know where I am going. Here is Jesus saying, look, I have a plan. I'm going to go get everything ready, 
and then we will be together forever. I have to tell you, I just had, I, this is not in here, I, it's just too funny not to tell. My grandmother um, that lived with my mom for many years before she passed, my mama, my, young, my oldest daughter, Golda, she was probably about three years old, three and a half, and my mama had fallen and broken her nose and was having a hard time. It had been weeks, she was feeling much better, and she brings Golda over to her and she says, Golda, Golda, Pray for Mama. Pray that Jesus makes my nose better. And my mom had this big sliding glass window. And she walked over to the sliding glass window, Golda did. And she looked up the, she goes, Mama Gooden, don't you know Jesus is too busy to think about your nose? He's up there building houses. (laughs) That's what I think about every time I read this text. He is up there building houses, but he's getting it ready. He's preparing a place for us because he wants to be with us. You see that the greatest gift is that he was willing to save us from our sins. And it's great. But part of that gift is that he wants to be with us, not just now, but forever so that we can go home. Every last bit of it was so that we could live in relationship, real, personal relationship, and not just far away, not just on FaceTime, not just kneeling down and saying, Jesus, come close to me, send the Holy Spirit, but so that someday he will show up here, folks, and he will say, I get to sit, forget FaceTime, folks, we are going to be right there together forever. That's the whole point. You see, God, the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, all of it, God the Father, they were willing to sacrifice it all to close that gap so that we could be close together throughout eternity, throughout Christ's ministry here on earth. He tried to tell the disciples what would happen, but they could not seem to grasp it. But in his final words in Matthew 28, let's turn over there, Matthew 28. Matthew 28. And we're going to read verses 19 and 20. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. He promises that he will never leave us, He will never forsake us. Look at, turn back over to Luke. Luke 24, verse 29. Luke 24. Verse 49. Verse 49. And now I will send you the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. When Jesus left us, physically, he sent us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in some ways, this is even more of an amazing gift. Because it's, it's not just able to be with us. He's able to be in us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That we can have such a close relationship with God right now that he will actually live in our hearts. He wants to be around us, in us working through us. So what does this mean for us today? This season, as you think about the birth of Christ, remember all he did to be with you. But please don't forget that right now, while we wait, what are we supposed to do? 
I urge you, take your with usness seriously. You see, God wants to be with us, but he we wants us to be with us. Does that make sense? He wants us to sit in close proximity to each other. He wants us to bring people to him. He wants us to gather as many people as possible so that when he comes back, nobody's left out. He wants us to take our with usness seriously. You see, we build up our relationship with him when we build up our relationship with each other. Let me ask you something. How far will you go to be with us? Are you willing to get dirty? Are you willing to go down to the lowest of the low in our minds? Are you willing to go to a homeless shelter and maybe not just pass out the food, but sit with somebody and ask them a couple questions about themselves? One of my favorite authors says that there's two kinds of people in the world. The kind of people that walk into a room and say, here I am. And the kind of people that walk into a room and say, there you are. Be a there you are kind of person. How far are you willing to go to be with us? Jesus was willing to go pretty far. He was willing to get pretty dirty. Remember that hay stuff? Remember the cross? He got pretty dirty. It wasn't pretty. How far are you willing to go to be with us? Take your with usness seriously while you wait. Just like in the garden, when Jesus called out, when God called out to Adam and Eve, where are you? He is calling out now to us. And he's calling us and telling us, bring your friend. Where are you? But bring your friend. That's the whole point of the Great Commission. Bring as many people as you can. One last text this morning. Turn over to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And we're going to read starting at verse 1. Then I saw a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. He's coming back, folks. He's gonna come and get us. He's going to be with us. One of my favorite songs um, is a Christmas song by the group Glad. I'm old, okay? I'm not even sure Glad is still together. Um, <clears throat> but it's called In the First Light. And the last line of this song, I think, sums up Christmas. You see, Christmas is about the first advent. It was amazing. But it's really about the second advent. That's what it's all about. 
Jesus came the first time so that he could come the second time. And it's going to be big. It's going to be beautiful. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for a well done when that comes. This is the last line of this song, and I think it sums up Christmas as a whole. It says, hear the angels as they're singing on the morning of his birth. But how much greater will our song be when he comes again to earth?